Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Rabbi David Levine, and this is Live From Home. And with my wife, Sandy, we want to give you a special welcome. All of the Mishpacha at Beth Israel Messianic Synagogue, we're glad to be together and together with our podcast listeners from around the world and everyone who's been able to connect with us through Facebook Live. This is the Arab Shabbat on Friday, May 22nd, 2020. And this evening, Brian and Deanne Rose will welcome us to their home and lead us in Hebrew prayers and worship. After that, Rabbi Yuri and I will return and we will study this week's Torah portion together and some other scriptures as well. And then we'll return to the Rose family home and we'll have a final worship song. So right now I want to invite you to hit the share button so you can let your friends know that this is a good time to join in with us. And also, if you like what we're doing, please hit the like and the follow buttons. And another invitation, join in with your comments. We consider it a wonderful privilege that you would join us today and we'd love to hear from you. And we want to give special greetings to our international friends. So if you're watching, live tonight and you are not in Jacksonville, Florida, let us hear from you and let us know where you are from, where you're uh, watching tonight. And we'll just be so glad to hear from you. This Shabbat is a fantastic time of joy and anticipation as we're counting our days towards Shavuot next week, a wonderful time of the year. So from Sandy and me, we say Shabbat Shalom. Now let's join the Rose family and live from home. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Beth Israel Live from Home. My name is Deanne Rose, and I am going to be ushering in the Shabbat with the lighting of the candles. Please join me, ladies. Baruch Atah Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kichano bivarecha, venatan lanu et yeshua mishicheinu, vatsivanu laihut, hola olam. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in your word and given us Yeshua our Messiah, and commanded us to be light to the world. Amen. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. And let's continue our service together with our beautiful Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Leolam Vaed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. Amen. And now the Veshamru. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Shabbat, they 
ימים תורות וברית עולם. כי ששת ימים עשה אדוני, עשה אדוני את השמיים ואת הארץ. ושמרו בני ישראל את השבת, לעשות את השבת לדורות וברית עולם. וביום השביעי ביום השביעי, שבת ויהי נפש, שבת ויהי נפש, ושמרו בני ישראל את השבת, לעשות את השבת לדורות הברית עולם. ושמרו בני ישראל את השבת, לעשות את השבת לדורות הברית Well, let's continue in worship, and we'll sing together. Make a joyful noise, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, clap your hands. Come into his presence singing, he is our maker and our king. joyful noise all ye lands serve the Lord with gladness clap your hands come into his presence singing he is our maker and our king so enter his gates with thanksgiving enter his courts with praise for the Lord he is able to be faithful through all our generations to be faithful through all our situations, to be faithful through all our generations. Know ye the Lord, he is good, it is he who made us, no man could. He is the shepherd, we his sheep, I know the Lord watches over me, so enter gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, for the Lord he is able to be faithful through all our generations, to be faithful through all our situations, to be faithful through all our generations. Let's sing Make a Joyful Noise. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness, clap your hands, come into his presence singing, he is our maker and our king, so enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, for the Lord he is able to be faithful through all our generations, to be faithful through all our situations, to be faithful through all over me. So enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. For the Lord he is able to be faithful through all our generations, to be faithful through all our situations, to be faithful through all our
Shabbat Shalom, congregation. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Brian and Diane, for beautiful worship. Thank you so much. I'm Rabbi Yuri, and welcome to our home. Right now, I want to ask you to hit the share button on this Facebook post so you can invite your Facebook friends to join us. And please, join in with your comments. Next week, we are entering the great biblical holiday, Shavuot. Shavuot is an important holiday on the Hebrew calendar. One of the appointed times that God commanded the to people to observe every year. According to Jewish tradition, it was upon this very day that God gave the Torah on Sinai. And it was also on Shavuot, the same day on the calendar, that the Holy Spirit first fell upon the disciples in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. It is such a great day. Today's chapter from, from the Torah teaches us about a very important topic and shows how the topic related to Shavuot, relates to Shavuot. And I would like to read from Numbers chapter 2, and please open scriptures with us. It is number chapter two, Numbers chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And let's read together. Numbers chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And again, please be careful here. Adonai said to Moses and Aaron saying, so it's, it was not an idea of Moses. It was not an idea of Aaron. It was Adonai, the Lord, who is saying to Moses and Aaron. Verse 2. Let each man encamp under his own standard among the banners of their ancestral house 
at an appropriate distance around the tenth of meeting. And in the same chapter, verse 17, Numbers 2, 17, because it's very uh, interesting places of scripture there together. Then the tent of meeting will move out with the camp of the Levites, which is in the middle of the camps. Just as they were in camp, each person in his own place, under his own appropriate standard. So interesting. And the whole chapter from the Torah speaks of the order that the Lord established within the camp of Israel. Whole chapter, whole Torah portion. When I read this, it reminds me of a place from Brita Hadashah, from New Testament. It's a very beautiful place. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Because God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Please think about it. Because God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. This happens in all the congregations of God's people. Last Shabbat, we talked about God's peace, the shalom that fills our hearts. The Lord filled us with his shalom to guide us, to protect us, and bring God's order into our lives. Because God, not a God of disorder, but he is the Lord of order. Obviously, God's shalom, his peace brings order and structure in our, into our lives, into our hearts. And this is very important to remember. Each tribe of Israel was to be in its own special place. It is so important. Everyone knew where his place was and what he should do. There was no disorder and aimlessness. When the sons of Israel walked through the wilderness in their tribes, there was an absolute order and the Lord himself arranged it. The Lord was an artist, a master. He arranged this order for himself. There is a very remarkable place in scriptures, in the Torah, and it's in number chapter 24, Numbers chapter 24, in the second verse, and five and six verse also. Numbers 24, verse two. Lifting up his eyes, Balaam saw Israel dwelling by tribes. So we know the story of Balaam. He was an enemy of Israel. So he saw Israel dwelling by tribes. The Ruach Elohim came over him. And he's praying, verse 5. This is his words. Words of enemy of Israel. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, and your dwellings, O Israel. Like valleys, they are spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by Adonai, like cedars beside the waters. Please think about it for one second. Even the enemy of Israel, the false prophet Balaam, recognized that Israel is beautiful, arranged, in perfect order. Even the enemy of Israel. But most amazing detail about this spectacular sight that the Lord who created this order placed himself at the very center of his own arrangement. He was in the middle, in the center of this beauty. The Lord is beautiful. And everything around him is beautiful. His presence brings beauty. All the camps of the people of Israel were built around the most significant feature in the arrangement, 
the tabernacle of the covenant in which the presence of God dwelt. What a deep meaning we see in today's chapter from the Torah. What a beautiful meaning. The Lord lives in the middle of Israel. Please, I would, I would like to capture your attention here. Please bear with me. The Lord lives in the middle of Israel. And where he is, there is no opportunity for chaos or disorder. We can see only the beauty of his orderliness, the splendor of his structure. And all the nations who looked upon Israel were astonished at the beauty of such precision. And in, and in the center of it all was the Lord himself. He was in the middle of this beauty. He's a beautiful Lord. Yeah, I know that we are not, we're all not perfect people, all of us. We still have many areas in life that we need healing from the Lord. We need the Lord to bring his order from him in his peace, in his shalom. And let us allow him to do that. It is so important for us. We can be encouraged by the life and ministry of our Lord and the Messiah, Yeshua. And I know that everything is possible for him. He brings healing and restoration in the lives of millions of people today, right now, delivering them from sin and disease. I want to read from Luke chapter 19, verse 1 and 10 and please open scriptures with me it's luke chapter 19 verse 1 and 10 it is a very important meaningful story important to remember for all of us because when we lose our hope he is our hope when we don't have uh, faith or we trouble in our lives he is full of faith and he is full of hope he is the lord of hope so this is the story, very interesting story, Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Now Yeshua entered Jericho and was passing through. And I love this place. He was passing through. It was not his final destination of his life. He was passing through. So many times Yeshua passing through and he's going. And it's our obligation to find him, to look for him to seek him with all our heart, and we will find him. He's promising us. So he's passing, passing through Jericho. And verse 2, And here was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. Here was a man. One of the thousands of people around him. Name of Zacchaeus. And now we know about this man. He's a famous man. Why? because he was able to find Yeshua. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. If the Bible says he was rich, it's literally he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Yeshua was, but he couldn't because of the crowd, for he was short in height. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Yeshua, for he was about to pass through that way. You know, it's almost, but the Lord is there. He's waiting for them, for him. And Zacchaeus was a rich and prosperous man. He had everything he needed money-wise. But we, we know later that he was hungry for freedom in his life, for truth. He was spiritually poor, and I believe it took humbleness for him because he was a rich person. He was famous. It, was, it took humbleness from him to climb to that tree. He humbled himself to find Yeshua. So let's read verse 5. When Yeshua came to the place, he looked up. I, I, can, I can see this picture. <laughs> this is the tree. And this is the man, uh, famous man in that place, very rich person, uh, tax collector, the chief of tax collectors. 
chief of Jacksonville tax collectors. And he was there on the tree looking for Yeshua. What an interesting picture here. So when Yeshua came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down, for I must stay at your house today. I believe it was very unexpected words to Zacchaeus. It was very interesting time for him. Zacchaeus hurried and came down and welcomed him joyfully. I love this word, joyfully. He was full of joy because it was more than he expected. He was not only able to see Yeshua, but he was able to receive Yeshua into his home. It was everything for him. He was happiest man. But, you know, it's always but, verse 7. When the Lord is doing something, we have always but. But even when everyone saw it, but when everyone saw it, they began to grumble, saying, Yeshua has gone to, the, to be the guest of a sinner. In the midst of beautiful picture, somebody said, what is he doing? Some super righteous people, they are there to judge, to cast judgment upon this man. Verse 8, But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, Master, half of my possessions I give to the poor, and if I have something cheated, any, somehow cheated anyone, I repay four times as much. I believe it took almost all his money. I don't know how much, but it was a difficult step for him. It was an important step for him. It was a step of restoration and God's order in his life. And verse 9, please think about it. Only now, only then, after, after this man decided to put God's order in his life, only after that Yeshua said this, famous words he said to him today salvation has come to this home because he also is a son of abraham i don't know when i read this i want to cry because it is this beautiful picture here salvation came, has come to this home for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Tax collectors were the most hated people in Israel at the time. Their job was to collect taxes for Rome, and they made money and enriched by robbing their own people. But Yeshua, he's the Lord, he brought salvation. And in salvation, in the salvation, because salvation is not only salvation of our soul or our spirit, but it is salvation of our life. In his salvation, he brought restoration. He brought God's order to the life of this man. He changed his life by his miracle, by his presence. Salvation is a way to restoration for us, for all of us. This is the only way. And Yeshua, he is the way, he is the truth. He is the gate to Father. After meeting with the living Yeshua, Zacchaeus was ready to correct injustice, to refund everything that he had stolen. How wonderful it is to see salvation in the life of a lost sinner when he is ready to fulfill his part, to repent, to perform shuva, to turn his life around for the Lord. Tomorrow I want to go deeper into this subject and read a few very interesting places of the scripture about the same subject. Thank you so much. And let us welcome Rabbi David from his home. Rabbi David. Thank you, Rabbi Yuri. That was a great word. It, it really encouraged me. When I was thinking of this picture of Yeshua speaking to everyone, and then he looks up in a tree and, and there's this guy who's not very tall, but he had used all of his effort 
to climb up into the tree. And Yeshua looks at him, recognizes him, calls him by name, and then tells him, come down and be with me. And I, and I thought, oh, he put all of his effort into getting up. And isn't that the way it is with us? Sometimes we put all, all of our effort into something. And then it turns out that the Lord wants us to draw close to him. All of our effort was good. It was an expression of what was in our heart and what we hoped for. Zacchaeus hoped to have fellowship with the Lord. He hoped to connect with him in some way. There was, there was some kind of activation of faith going on in Zacchaeus. But when Yeshua called him by name, and when he called him down, then Zacchaeus had the chance to hear the voice of the Lord and to do what he said. And he did just that. What a, what a great story and what a great expression of how the Lord goes after people who are looking for him. If you seek me with all of your heart, you'll find me, the scripture says about the Lord. Well, this was a wonderful message from Rabbi Uri. I look forward to tomorrow's installment as well. Don't forget to, to join us tomorrow morning at 1030 for another segment of Live From Home. We'll have more worship. We'll hear more from Rabbi Uri and I'll continue to share as well. And I do have something I want to share with you, but before I share from the scriptures, I, I want to wish my wife happy anniversary. Tomorrow is our 44th anniversary. And I want to right a wrong from our past. You see, um, Sandy had really hoped that I would propose to her on the radio because I was a newsman in Roanoke, Virginia, where we lived on WROV. And I didn't do it. But right now, I want to ask Sandy, would you marry me? Well, actually, I know you will, but I don't know how to fix it. So I'm going to ask you again, please marry me. And then let's apply this backwards. And if you say yes, I'll be very happy. Actually, I'm very happy that we've been married. Tomorrow will be 44 years, a wonderful marriage that we have together. And Sandy is my best friend and companion and um, my most trusted cohort with the Lord. So I love you, Sandy, and happy anniversary tomorrow. Hey, everyone who's out of town and watching with us right now, why don't we, uh, why don't you share with us where you're from if you haven't already? We love to hear from our out of town friends. And um, it's great if you would also share what city or state or country that you're from. I have a few prayer requests as well. We want to pray for Willie Woods, Florence's husband. He is in the hospital right now. He's losing blood. He's getting an emergency transfusion. And Flo let me know about this. And I asked if it would be OK for us to pray for him. He'll be at, um, admitted to Mayo Hospital in Jacksonville today. So let's lift up Willie. Lord, we, we pray for Willie right now and we pray for life to return to him. We pray for the transfusion. We pray also for whatever is going on in his body, causing him to have a loss of blood. We know that there's life in the blood, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you would impart life to him and you would restore life to him in the name of Yeshua. We also want to pray for Elizabeth Stone. She is going to be having surgery this coming week on her spine and neck, and it's... Um, it's quite a delicate surgery, so we want to pray for her. Lord, we lift Elizabeth up to you right now in the name of Yeshua. And we pray for safety for her. And we pray for good results. Lord, I pray for healing for her, for a, a wonderful process with careful surgery without any complications whatsoever. And I pray, Lord, for restoration for her, even as she has repairs to her spine, her vertebra, to the discs. Lord, let there be protection for the nerves and all of the delicate parts there. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Everyone, I thank you for joining in prayer with us because we're called to be a house of prayer. Yeshua said that about his house. My house will be a house of prayer. And one of the ways we do that 
is we take time during our Shabbat services, normally when we're gathering at the synagogue sanctuary to pray for specific people about spe specific things as part of our the life of our mishpacha. And so this is one of the things that we normally do when we are together. And those of you who listen by podcast, you may not ever get to hear the whole thing or see the whole thing that we're doing in the sanctuary, but tonight you can. One more family we want to pray for. We want to pray for continued outpouring of comfort and condolence for Rad and Jill and the whole Akawi family. Rad's mom, Irene, passed away today, and our hearts go out to them. And I talked with Rad this afternoon, and he told me how it was truly a glorious thing that the Lord was present with his mom and with the whole family as they gathered together and he described to me what happened when they prayed for the Lord to receive his mom and then she breathed her last breath and she was gone and she was with the Lord. It was a, a beautiful description that he gave and, and Rad told me about how the Lord gave him courage and faith and peace and is continuing to comfort him even right now and we just want to pray for Rad and his family now. Lord, we lift Rad up to you, and we thank you for your mercy being done. Thank you for the heart of service that you gave him and the redemptive position that he and his whole family took with his mom. You restore even what the locust and the canker worm have eaten. Thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning, and the way that you express that mercy, we're just so grateful for. And we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit even now, tonight, to the families they're gathering together and you would pour out comfort in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, whenever we're in the synagogue sanctuary, I always like to begin our study portion with a prayer. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commands and commands us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Amen. As we are anticipating Shavuot, uh, this Shabbat is a good time to consider Yeshua and the Holy Spirit. Shavuot will take place next week. And, and I want to talk about some challenging thoughts about Yeshua as a man and about the Holy Spirit as God. And Tonight, I, I want you to join me in thinking about Yeshua the man, because the story is really important. God came down to be with humanity. God came down, he took on a human body, and he joined humanity in order to live with us, in order to become a kinsman redeemer. For the sake of our own redemption, we needed one who was part of our family to redeem us. That part of the law of God is revealed in the Torah. And Yeshua, Yeshua made himself, how can we put it? He made himself small. Is that a way to put it? We could, we could use a Hebrew word that describes it, tzimtzum. This is a Hebrew concept that really isn't found in, in Christian uh, categories of thought, but tzimtzum is, is applied to God this way. It means that God restrained himself or he made himself small or he, he put some limitations on himself as sovereign. He could do that. He, he did this so that he could create and there would be room in what would become the universe for the material world and, and for humanity. And God made Tzimtzum as well so that humanity, each man, each woman, even children, would have the ability to make decisions themselves. Each of us would be given a gift of free will. Well, how is that possible if God is sovereign, if he's all powerful and all knowing? How can there be room? Well, Tzimtzum is the expression of that. He, he made room for us in his sovereignty, even though he could be everything and could fill up all that could ever be, he made room for creation. 
He made room for humanity. He made room for you and me to have the ability to make decisions that have lasting impact and even eternal consequences. He gave us the opportunity to learn to love and he also gave us the opportunity to learn to turn around and turn to him to fix our ways to recognize our own defects and our own estrangement from god and he gave us the means by which we could come to him so tsum it's a interesting and important idea and it's also important when you think about yeshua the messiah being adonai the lord it's not that yeshua was a man who became so good he became a perfect man and he was elevated to divinity that's not really how it happened and if you had that understanding as, as i did when i was growing up as a young jewish man that's what i thought christians believed but it was a mistake it, that's not the correct understanding of what the new testament scriptures teach us they teach us that God came down and took on a human body, that he took on this human body and then he grew up as a human, God inside of a human body. How is this possible? Well, the answer is Tsum Tsum. God can make himself small. He can put constraints upon himself, if you will. That's what it looks like from the human perspective. and. And God was able to make room for his own humanness to fully function in the way that our humanness functions. Now I'm using humanness, it's sort of an awkward term, we could say humanity, but I'm not thinking about humanity in general, I'm talking about human characteristics. You see, when God took on a human body, it was God inside of a human body but the human body fully functioned and think about what that human that that Yeshua was he was a God inside of a human body a mortal human body the eternal the uh, immortal God inside of a mortal body well he had emotions he had thoughts he had physical sensations. He could taste. He could smell. He could touch things. He could hear. He could see. All the human senses were functioning in a normal human way for Yeshua. All the human processes were functioning. He could get hungry and need to eat. But those functions that God has given us that are part of our human being, if you will, they're not meant to rule over us. They are meant to be in service to our life on this earth and our life with God. And so there's, there's like an indication of this in, in the Psalm, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. You see, the psalmist knew that our soul and our spirit have higher authority than our senses. And there are times when we need to allow our spirit and soul to exercise authority, to have higher authority than what our normal human senses would have. Now, I, I want to ask you to join me in a look at a passage in Isaiah it's Isaiah chapter 11, the first five verses. And we'll just be reading um, this together and I'll stop and pause at, at times in order to make some comments. It starts this way, Isaiah 11, one, then a tender shoot will spring from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So the picture is there is a stump of Jesse. Jesse is like a tree or a strong vine that has uh, become thick, but it's been cut down. But now there's a tender shoot coming up, a, a, a tiny green sprout, if you will, coming up from the stump. And it's a picture of a person coming from Jesse. Verse two, the spirit 
of the Lord will rest on him. That's how we know that, that verse 1 is about a person because verse 2 tells us that the spirit of the Lord, Ruach HaKodesh, Ruach Elohim, will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Okay, so this is speaking about Yeshua. It's a prophetic passage about Messiah, but it's telling us something about him, that Messiah will delight in the fear of the Lord. And it also tells us in the next part of verse 3 about how he exercised authority over his normal human senses. He had normal human senses. He could feel, he could think, he could see, he could hear, but he used them in a very specific way. This is what it says. He will delight in the fear of the Lord and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. He doesn't depend on his senses alone, not his visual sense, his eyes, not his aural sense, his ears. And this is so useful for us to learn about. Messiah in a human body, when he walked among us, when he saw Zacchaeus in the tree, when he heard from Zacchaeus, he could see, he could hear, he had those normal senses. But this is what's interesting about Messiah. He did not only depend on his human senses. His senses were there, they were functioning, they were useful for him. He was in a human body with real human sensation and sense. Verse four tells us that he won't judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but verse four, with righteousness, he will judge the poor and he will decide with fairness or justice for the afflicted of the earth. Righteousness and fairness will give, a, will, will give in a sense, a higher voice. They will give another perspective to Yeshua and he will accomplish justice for the poor and for the afflicted. So now we know something about him. Even though he comes with a human body, even though his humanity was established, even though he was fully a man, he did not allow his senses to have the very last word. They functioned, they contributed to his understanding. He thought, he felt, he saw, he had all the normal sensations, but righteousness and justice were higher and he subordinated his senses to the, the perfect sensations that God had. Now look at the next part of verse four. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And I want you to focus on one detail. This is an expression of the authority that he has. He has the authority to strike the earth with his own mouth and to slay the wicked. What incredible authority. But he sometimes would restrain himself, as we can see. When he had fellowship with Zacchaeus, he wasn't there to judge Zacchaeus. When he communicated with the sick, the poor, the, the sinner, the prostitute, the tax collector, his goal was to restore and to revive, not to judge and condemn. He uses his authority to build up, not to tear down. Now it says also about him in verse five, righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness, the belt about his waist. And I think this passage and these references inspired Paul when he was writing about spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter six. So Yeshua was, was God inside of a human body. It's so fascinating. When, when he was crucified, he suffered because all of his senses were working. All of his bodily senses were working. And yet, 
what died was his human body, his mortal body. And that was then resurrected. Did the spirit of God die? No. Did the eternal God die? No. God became a kinsman redeemer. Tsum is, I think, a great explanation for that. He made himself small and limited in such a way that he could come down and be with us. He made himself small so that he could enter into the life we have. But then he showed us something. He kept his eyes on the Father. He only said what he heard the Father saying. He only did what he saw the Father doing. Now, why did he put it this way? Because his humanity, his humanness, and all of his sensations needed to be subordinated. They needed to be, um, they were a factor that he had to deal with. He was inside of a human body, and what if he allowed his sensations to have the last word? Well, he, like you or like me, would come to wrong conclusions, would feel the wrong thing and think, oh, that's the correct thing. You know how our emotions are not reliable? They can be sometimes correct. They sometimes are discerning. Same with our thought process. And, and our intellect can be wise and can be discerning. But neither our intellect nor our emotions nor any part of our personality is perfect. And they can mislead us. The heart, the scripture says, is deceitful. And it can mislead us. And it can't be trusted. Even though we depend on it, it can't be trusted. Yeshua was inside of a human body and form that had all of those things functioning, and he needed a way of staying connected to God that would be a model for human beings. How did he do it? He kept connected to the Father. He watched the Father. He listened to the Father. He didn't only listen to the words that others were saying. He didn't only judge by what his eyes, his human eyes were saying. He allowed himself to connect with God in a way that became a model for us. You see, when Yeshua paid the price for us, when he died on the cross, and then he descended into the 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 lower world to rescue those who were waiting for him it's an amazing thing what he was doing he was redeeming us and this was part of the messianic mandate if you will this was part of what messiah was called to do but it was not only what messiah was called to do messiah also had after having completed that having been resurrected and then glorified, had to return to heaven in order to send the Holy Spirit down to the earth in order to fill up human beings. You see, Yeshua was like a prototype, God taking up residence inside of a human body. He was a prototype of what God wanted to do for all humanity. And when Yeshua returned to heaven, he had that experience and that knowledge of what it's like to live inside this frail and fragile and unreliable human body, and yet a body that can sense so much and a body that can actually be the container for our spirit and soul. And it's this humanity, this humanness that God has given us that has to learn to love God and has to learn to trust God. Yeshua demonstrated for us how to do it. And when he returned to heaven, Something had changed in the whole dynamics of eternity and the temporal, the time and space world. Because Yeshua had accomplished redemption. He had made it possible now for the Spirit of God to be sent from heaven down to earth to take up residence in you and me. Our humanness needs the Spirit of God. You see, what's, what's the protection for you and for me? It's that we receive the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, the divine spirit, the spirit of God, Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of the living God would take up residence in us. How does he do that? Tzimtzum. He makes himself small to find a place inside of us to live. He lives inside of our hearts, inside of our being. 
in all that we are. He lives in our minds. He lives in all of our humanness again. Yeshua demonstrated what it's like when God does something in this fashion. And he gave us a pattern for it. Now, here's the thing that's different about us and Yeshua. Yeshua had a human body. You and I have a human body. So in that regard, we're equal. But Yeshua was God fully who took up residence inside of a human body. And you and I are not God fully, but when we receive the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, who is fully God, takes up his place in us. We want to give him a bigger and bigger place, a stronger and stronger place in us. We want him to have more and more authority in us. And we actually need the Holy Spirit and as we're coming close to the Lord and as our sins are forgiven through Messiah, we recognize that there's a broken aspect to our spirit. Our, our spirit is, is infirmed, if you will. It's like congested arteries or a tooth with a cavity or a sprained ankle. It, it doesn't function all that perfectly. It feels pain. It accentuates the pain. And it's, it can work, but not perfectly. How did Yeshua deal with these limitations of his human nature? He submitted his human nature under the Father. How did he do that? He drew close to the Father. He recognized God the Father, perfect in his holiness. God the Father is God without the constraints of a human body or form. And he's utterly perfect in his holiness. And he's utterly perfect in his truth and his goodness, God of gods and Lord of lords. He's eternal, he's just, he's compassionate, he's steady, he's all powerful, he is sovereign, he's fatherly, he's hopeful, he's peaceful, he's, un, he's all knowing and he's unwavering. That God is the one who came down and became Messiah for us. He cloaked himself in a human body. He communed then with the Lord without a body. One Lord, one spirit, echad, united and whole. Yeshua pointed out this wonderful uh, and challenging thought when he quoted from Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for you your feet. It was a prophetic passage that David wrote in the Psalms. And Moses had some experience of the Lord calling out to the Lord. It's in Exodus 34, verse 5. It says, the Lord descended in a cloud and stood next to Moses. That's so interesting. The Lord made himself small yet again and, and was present right there with Moses and then proclaimed his name, the Lord. And then the Lord passed in front of Moses and he called out the Lord, the Lord, God, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger or abounding in loving devotion and faithfulness. The Lord was standing next to Moses and the Lord passed by in front of Moses and the Lord called out to the Lord. You see, that's how it was working as well with Yeshua. The Lord called out to the Lord. When Yeshua returned to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to live within us. And we make a home for him. We welcome him. We receive him. The Spirit of God in us teaches us, guides us, gives us boldness, adds power to us. He works through us. He adds gifts to us and he enables us to connect with God. We need the Spirit of God. And that's why Yeshua told his disciples to wait together until the Holy Spirit was poured out on them on Shavuot. We need the Holy Spirit personally. We need his ministry. We need his gifts. We need his power. We need his perspective. We need him to live for God. And I want to encourage you as we're anticipating Shavuot in just the days ahead, take time to say to the Lord, I need your spirit. I need to be filled with your spirit. I need to be immersed in your spirit. I need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I tell you, friends, as you do that, God will find a way to answer your prayer. 
we're going to pray for people on Shavuot, even though we can't be physically together I, on this coming weekend. We are going to pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the great promise of Shavuot. So next, next week, be prepared for that. We want to pray for you even during our services, and we want to connect with you and let you have the wonderful joy of being filled with the Holy Spirit, of being immersed or baptized with the Holy Spirit and receiving gifts from the Holy Spirit. You really can't live without the Spirit of God the way that God has in mind for you. That's why this is one of the great things that Yeshua accomplished for us. He made it possible for the Spirit of God to be sent to each one of us. I'm excited about what's ahead and I'm so thankful to Yeshua for what he has done for us. And I know that some of these things are, are complex. They're difficult to explain or even to understand, but I hope you'll give some thought to this, that God himself came down. He made himself small. He, he, he restrained himself, constrained himself, limited himself in such a way that he, he could take up residence inside of a human body. He lived among us, Yeshua, Mashiach, is Adonai. He is the Lord and the Savior. This is the one who we worship. It's not idolatry to worship Yeshua because he is Adonai. If he was a man who became God, it would be idolatry. But he's God who became man. He's our kinsman redeemer. God has proven time and time again. He knows how to come down into this earth and be with us. And the great promise that you and I would become little sanctuaries for the Lord. We would receive the Lord and he could live with us. This is fulfilled only through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is made possible and available to you through your turning to Yeshua in faith, in trust, with a repentant heart and a lifelong desire to serve him and to be a disciple. So I want to share those words with you. I hope they help you and give you some meat to think about, some things to chew on, in these days ahead. Well, I want to take time to thank all of you who are connecting with others in the congregation and taking the time when the Lord puts someone on your heart to actually call them or write them, email them, text them, send them a note or a letter. And when you're doing that, it makes um, an impact on people. Thanks to each of you who is part of Beth Israel's Mishpacha, who's taken the time to connect like this. As your rabbis and Rebbitson, we appreciate you doing this so much. We are so grateful to everyone at Beth Israel for your continuing support. Your faithful and steady giving means so much to us and it makes it easier for us to expand our efforts during this time and to do more together as a community. And even though we haven't been able to use our building these last couple of months, we have all the regular expenses. We're grateful for your generosity for your cheerfulness, and for your sacrificial giving above and beyond your tithes and offerings. If you want to support us through our online giving um, portals, you can go to bethisraelnow.com slash giving, and you'll find all the links and all the instructions so that you can access Giving Fire or PayPal, your choice. They're both very secure, easy to set up. We've had no security problems whatsoever with those. So thank you for your continued giving. And I want to close tonight with Aaron's blessing, as we normally do at Beth Israel. And then after that, we'll return to the Rose Home. But join with me. Yivarechecha Adonai, v'yishmarecha. Ya'er Adonai, p'nave lecha v'yichunecha, yisa Adonai, p'nave lecha. Vayasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep watch over you and protect you. The Lord cause the light of his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you his peace in the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace. Amen. So Sandy and I want to say Shabbat Shalom and we want to join now the Rose family for our final worship song.
I wanted to hide and to hold your I remember when first I loved you, how afraid I was to be loved so true, how I wanted to live my whole life with you, how I wanted to run, yet be close to you. At your side, I lack Think you lead me by peaceful streams, you're my guide, so I fear nothing, your gentle hand is all I need. I remember when I first questioned you, when the heart came wondering where were you but when I disbelieved you believed in me when my faith was unworthy you were faithful to me your presence is sovereign over all of life's troubles no trial or temptation can keep you from me and while this life still brings sorrow sadness and rain you lift me up from the valley with the strength of your hand at your side i lack nothing you lead me by peaceful streams you're my guide so i Lord, thank you for your gentle hand that's holding each one of us right now close to your heart. Thank you, Father, that your word says that you hide us in the shadow of your wing, Lord, that we're safe, that we are protected, that we are loved and deeply cared for. Father, I pray, Lord, for everyone who's in need of your comfort everyone who's in need of your companionship. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would bring them close to your heart. I pray, Father, that each person who needs a touch from you would receive that special touch, Lord. In the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, the one who loves us, who knows us, our kinsman redeemer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight for this time of worship. And we will be back tomorrow morning. And we hope you join us then as well. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Have a great night.